Good morning. I will give two more minutes to let anyone who's behind join us. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for ALS Webinar Wednesday series. My name is Alejandra Herrera and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for ALS North America. I will be facilitating the webinar today. If you're having technical issues with our webinar platform or you have any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You can also select the hand icon to notify me of your status so I can assist you. All questions regarding the webinar will be answered at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Jordan DeSantis. Jordan is a graduate of Arizona State University with both bachelor's and master's degrees. She's worked for Bioscreen ALS for 10 years, specializing in sunscreen testing and cosmetic efficiency. Today, Jordan will be discussing all you need to know about sun protection factor testing. Jordan, I will now turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks for joining us this morning to talk about SPF testing uh, with us at Bioscreen ALS. Um, so we can just go ahead and get started. So just a quick introduction, uh, Bioscreen offers SPF testing um, all of our testing that we offer will comply with FDA or international regulations. Um, so it's very important that if you're going to be testing a sunscreen product that you understand the market in which you're going to be selling the product. Um, each market will have a different required type of test, um, different labeling requirements. So it's, it's very important that you know where this product is intended to be sold. Um, if you're unsure about what that particular market may require, we're definitely uh, interested in, in helping you determine which tests are appropriate for that market, and we can help you get uh, your testing needs in line. All SPF testing equipment is required to be calibrated um, on a regular basis. We calibrate our instruments at least annually to uh, specific standards. And that allows us to certify our instruments to ensure that they're in compliance with all the testing protocols. Um, so that's either if it's strictly FDA testing, international testing, the equipment is, is certified to ensure compliance with their regulations. In addition to uh, the annual service, we also ensure that our light sources are tested on a daily basis. We check them for the intensity and for beam uniformity. Um, some of these tests are not a requirement on a daily basis, uh, but it is something that we, we do daily just to make sure that our, our standards are as high as possible. Bioscreen has eight multi-port solar simulators. Uh, we also have additional testing sites outside of our testing site right now that I'm working out of in Phoenix. 
So because of that, BioScreen can offer SPF testing in, in a timely, turnaround timely fashion. Multi-port solar simulators. This is the equipment that we're using for SPF testing. Uh, just a little bit of basic information about it. Uh, it's a 300 watt ozone free short arc xenon lamp. Um, as you can see, this equipment is from Solar Light Company. It has six individual ports and each of these ports can be controlled individually to provide a specific UV dose or we can turn them off entirely so that we don't have to use all the ports if we don't need them. It has an articulating arm which can be adjusted uh, it, to, in accordance with the subject positioning. It allows for SPF testing, so UVA plus UVB spectrum, or we can change it to just do UVA only, um, and we'll go into some UVA types of tests. Uh, it has an automatic dose controller for continuous monitoring of the UV output, so this will allow us to provide accurate UV dose amounts over the tested sunscreen or an untreated area. And the stick is in a prone or laying down position for the duration of the testing. It's important to note what position the subject is being tested in. Um, one, for feasibility of the test, and two, because the testing position is, is important throughout the course of the test, you have to maintain that position. For SPF determination, the subject selection is very important. One, it's regulated by the FDA or the international testing regulations. Um, and then two, it's important because we are required to test on individuals who will show us an erythemal response or essentially a sunburn. So because of that, we're looking for individuals who have Fitzpatrick skin type criteria one, two, or three, that's specifically for FDA requirements. Um, the, if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you can see that Fitzpatrick's one, two, and three correlate to individuals with ivory, beige, or light brown type of skin tones. These individuals will typically burn when they're exposed to UV. So again, we're looking for an erythemal response. So by using individuals who typically burn will give us that sort of response. We are also looking for individuals with an ITA criteria or an individual typology angle of greater than 28. Essentially what that means is the same thing as criteria one, two, or three. It's individuals with ivory, beige, or light brown skin tones that will burn when exposed to UV. We are interested in individuals who are not taking any topical or systemic medications that would alter the response to UV radiation. We want to see what the UV radiation does to individuals' skin without medication that may worsen a sunburn or medication that may hinder a sunburn or erythema response. Of course, we want individuals who do not have a history of sensitivities to topical products. Again, we're looking to see about erythema responses. If an individual is sensitive to topical products, they may have a reaction to the product itself and not necessarily the exposure. We're looking for individuals who uh, are adequately evaluated for uniform skin color. So we're looking for individuals who don't have a, any sunburn, nevi, excessive hair, disfigurations, such as uh, scars or anything over the, the test site that we're evaluating. Again, we're looking for the skin's reaction to UV, should they have any of these things that may hinder that response, we obviously don't want to use them. Um, and then we also don't want to use individuals who have uneven skin tone that the response from the UV would be, we're unsure if it's the UV response or if it's actually their skin itself without the presence of UV. So, I would like to just discuss uh, during this presentation a very basic understanding of what an SPF test entails. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's a simple breakdown of a sunscreen test. Uh, there's a lot more technicalities behind the test itself that are not gonna be presented today. Um, if that's something that interests you, I am 
very happy to, to help answer some of those questions after the webinar. Um, but for today's purpose, I just want to make sure that we have a very basic understanding of what goes into sunscreen testing. So the first thing that we are interested in determining in an SPF test is what is the minimal erythemal dose on unprotected skin? So, an, um, so for short, we'll call that an MED. The minimal erythemal dose is how much UV is required to give the very basic erythemal response on unprotected skin. So in order to do that, we can do this one of two ways. We can test an unprotected area of skin using a provisional test, or we can estimate what UV dose would give an MED based on the subject's ITA or their skin tone. So what we'll do is we will take an area of the subject's back, which is what we use as a test key, and we'll demarcate essentially a, a little square or a rectangle. Within this area, we're going to expose five areas to UV. The exposure series that we're gonna give is centered around on what we think the subject's MED might be based on their skin tone. So based on a, an individual skin tone, we may think that the third exposure site is going to give us an erythemal response at this UV dose, X UV dose. So we would provide that UV dose in the center of the series. And then the remaining sites are given a progressively lower UV dose and then a progressively higher UV dose. And I'll have an example of this on the next screen. So for example, we may center uh, a UV dose and then sites Four and five are gonna be increasing in UV by 25%, and sites two and one would be decreasing by 25%. That way, we are giving a series of UV doses that are progressively higher, one higher than the previous, so that we can see what UV dose is going to cause that erythemal response on unprotected skin. Following the UV exposure, the individuals are going to be dismissed, and we're going to ask them to come back between 16 to 24 hours after that test is given, and we're going to evaluate where that erythemal response is. So the MED is defined as the lowest UV dose with perceptible, unambiguous erythema with defined borders filling more than 50% of the exposure subsite. The MED definition is super important because MEDs are what we use to evaluate throughout the entire test, whether it be on unprotected skin or on sunscreen or product protected. So here's an example of what we'll call an MED. So this MED, uh, this example MED was done on a subject for, that had an ITA of 50. So they had fair enough skin that when exposed to UV, they would, they would produce an erythemal response. These UV doses were given using a 12% progression and it was centered around subsite three. So subsite three is our midpoint dose. It's what we expect this person with an ITA of 50 may show for an MED on unprotected skin. Now, the subsites one and two are 12% less than the previous, and subsites four and five are 12% higher than subsite three. So this is showing us that we're gonna test five areas on unprotected skin. Each subsite that we're testing is progressively higher in UV dose than the previous. And we're gonna use this information to determine what our subjects MED on unprotected skin is. If you're looking at the image, um, you'll notice that you'll see really not much going on at subsite one, not much going on at subsite two, maybe a little something going on at subsite three. But if you start to see subsite four, you'll see that there is a very defined square. It has erythema throughout the entire test site. And then again, you can see that on subsite five. Because of this, we would state that our subject's MED on unprotected skin 
shows at subsite four using 260 joules per meter squared of energy or, or UV, okay? So that's very important because now that number, that 260 is uh, a, a data point that we're gonna be using throughout the course of the study, okay? So that's just a basic understanding, basic definition of what will what is an MED and specifically on untreated or unprotected skin. We're gonna bring this example back in a little bit to show us how we're actually gonna determine the SPF of our test sample. So the next step in the process is to apply the sunscreen to the individual. Test products and the sunscreen standard that we use, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, are applied to a test site at two milligrams per centimeter squared plus or minus. It's very important that all the products are shaken and or stirred depending on the consistency of the product prior to application onto the test site. We do this to ensure that there's a uniform dispersion, dispersion of active ingredients within the sample itself. Um, as we all know, sometimes samples may settle or, or, or separate. So it's very important that we take this step prior to applying the product. We do a weight by loss method. Uh, that is to ensure that we are applying this appropriate amount that's set forth by the, the sunscreen standards. And then once the application is complete, we evaluate the products using a UVA woods lamp. This allows the product to essentially either glow or darken. Um, and this is to make sure that our application is uniform. So we're looking for no streaking, no clumping, um, that the app, the product is, is filling the entire area of the test site. If we are finding that there's issues with the application, we will reject that application entirely and we're not gonna use that site for testing. If another site is available, we'll attempt a new application um, and again, reevaluate and uh, assess if we can test the product. After the product is applied, they're given time to dry. Uh, the FDA states a minimum of 15 minutes. The ISO standard states 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and just to, to clarify, the FDA standard is specific to the US market. Um, and then the ISO standard is much more broad, much more accepted in a, a, a large number of countries, uh, but just not the US. So the product application of sunscreen is extremely important in the testing process. Um, so in order to spread sunscreen products, there's a, a few different methods that you can use um, depending on the form, the dosage form of the product. There are fluid products, which you would think of your normal lotions, creams. Uh, and in order to spread and apply that product, what we do is we do a number of droplets of the product onto the test site. We use our syringe and our weight by loss method. And then we spread the product evenly over the entire test site using circular movements. Then that allows us to gather all the droplets and move them into the, the appropriate areas. And then we'll follow that with horizontal and vertical strokes using light pressure. Um, and that allows for a very even application of the product over the site. Uh, during the entire process, the finger stays in contact with the skin. Um, and that's to avoid lifting product off. If you were to take your finger off the site every time, you may be removing product. Um, as for powders, uh, it's sort of similar. The powders are transferred onto the skin using a grid-like manner. Uh, we then tap and spread the powder over the entire test site. If needed, we could use water on the skin prior to applying the powder. That helps make sure that the powder actually sticks to the site and you know, doesn't fly off. Um, the only stipulation is, is that the water should not transform the powder into a paste. You can't transform the product. Um, so, so long as the powder stays a powder, water can be used to help the powder adhere to the skin. For samples that are non-flowing viscous liquids or semi-solids, um, the product would be measured into a weigh boat and applied 
by the finger, essentially in the same manner in multiple areas throughout the test site. And then similar movements are used to spread that product. So basically it's instead of using a syringe where we're putting the product into the weight boat first. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, the, the sunscreen is first applied using a, a series of dots over the entire test area. And then you can see that you'll use circular motions to spread those, those dots and then horizontal and vertical strokes until you have a nice uniform application. Um, I asked someone to give me a quick example of what a spread product would look like under a UV lamp. Um, and it's something like this. Uh, as you can see, the product glows. So we can see that the product is covering the entire test site. There's no streaking. Um, so this is a, a, an example of uh, a product that may be used for sunscreen testing, knowing that it has a nice even application over the entire test site. Each individual also will have a sunscreen standard applied in conjunction with the test of the, uh, the sample, the submitted sample. So the sunscreen standard is used as a control or a reference, and it has to fall within acceptance limits for the test to be considered valid. So for FDA, they strictly use uh, a sunscreen standard called P2 on every test subject. The international testing regulation uh, takes this a bit further and it's dependent on the SPF claim. So if your SPF claim is less than or equal to 24, you can go ahead and use P2 on all your subjects. If it's greater than or equal to 25, but less than 50, you also have to include P5 or P6 in addition to your P2 or P3. Um, and then for SPF greater than or equal to 50, they, you have to include a P8 reference standard. Basically what this is, is um, as you increase your claim, these additional sunscreen standards, P5, P6, and P8, they also increase in expected SPF value. So essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to compare apples to apples. Um, so your SPF 50 claim is also going to be controlled or have a reference standard of another SPF, value, uh, SPF product of a similar value. So once our products are evenly, nicely applied to our test site and they've gone through the appropriate dry time, we can then go ahead and move forward with exposing these products to UV. So similar to that of the untreated MED, we center the doses on a midpoint UV dose. So we're gonna go ahead and call that on subsite three. And then again, the remaining sites are given progressively lower or progressively higher UV doses, all centered around that midpoint dose. The doses that we give for the midpoint is calculated by multiplying that MED untreated dose by the expected SPF value. Then uh, we give the dose progressions either higher or lower for the FDA and the international regulations, they are dependent on the expected SPF value. FDA takes it into a three-tier system, whereas the international regulations do a two-tiered system. Um, the international has recommended dose progressions. You can use lower dose progressions so long as you remain consistently using those dose progressions on all product and unprotected sites. So there, uh, depend, regardless of what you're testing, be it in SPF 25, the sunscreen standard, unprotected site, so long as you're using the same dose progression on every one of those sites, that's just fine. Whereas FDA, it varies depending on what that expected SPF value is. So here's an example of what we would do for UV doses. And let's take our previously discussed MED on untreated skin, and we'll essentially apply that to as if we were testing an SPF 15. So as we discussed earlier, we decided that we're gonna call our MED on untreated skin at site four. 
because we can see this nice defined area of erythema. It's taking up more than 50% of that test subsite. Um, so we're gonna call that our MED. Again, our MED at subsite four uses 260 joules per meter squared of effective energy. Now what we'll do is because we have a target SPF 15, and for example, for this particular example, we're just gonna use a 12% progression. We are now taking that 260 joules per meter squared of energy. We're gonna multiply that by our target SPF value, which is 15. And we're gonna center that dose over our product protected site. So the 260 times 15 will give us 3,480 joules per meter squared of effective energy. Um, and then what we'll do is we are going to do our 12% lower and then our 12% higher. Disregard that, it should be 260. So these are the doses that we would be giving over the product protected skin, assuming that it's going to protect at an SPF 15 level. Once we provide those doses, we're also going to do the sim a similar method for the sunscreen standard. Again, we're going to, it's going to be dependent on the target SPF value of that sunscreen standard. Once our test is complete, we let our individuals leave the testing site and then they are coming back 16 to 24 hours following these exposures. During the time that they're not here, they're instructed to avoid any additional UV exposure onto those test sites. They're instructed to avoid taking any of those exclusionary medications that they should not be taking. Um, and then, you know, they're instructed to really avoid tampering with the site itself, scratching, anything like that. Again, when they come back 16 to 24 hours later, we're going to grade these areas. And grading is performed in a blind manner. So that means that the person who's doing the evaluation of these sites is not the same person who performed the exposures or did the application. This person should have no idea whether they're, test, they're evaluating unprotected skin, product protected skin, standard protected skin, um, completely blind to this process. The visual grading is done in a room with matte neutral walls. The assessment is performed using sufficient light source of at least 450 lux and of a defined color temperature. Um, and then our visual graders have annual eye exams performed both for visual acuity and color. Um, this is an additional step to make sure that A, they can see those defined borders and they can see if it's an erythemal response. So here's the results of our test, our, our fake test that we just did. Um, so again, we had our initial MED up here on unprotected skin, showed us up at site four. Uh, we exposed the sunscreen sample to these UV doses. And now we're gonna do our calculation to determine what those results are. So again, our MED was at 260 joules per meter squared. We gave that a grade one at subsite four, so that determines our MED. Let's pretend that our product showed us an erythema response at subsite three. That's where we determined was the MED of the product protected site. And in order to calculate the SPF of this individual, we take that MED of the product protected site and then we divide it by the MED of the unprotected site. So you're getting 3,480 divided by 260, and the SPF value that resulted from this individual was 13.4. So you can see that it's a little bit under that target SPF of 15, but of course that's why we do this test, right? To determine the true SPF value of a sample after being tested on skin, on people. Um, so this individual has a SPF of 13.4. That's not to say that everybody is going to have an SPF of 13.4. Some people may come back and their results indicate an SPF 18. Um, it just is dependent on an individual's skin and how they react to UV exposure. At the end of the day, the results of your actual SPF value, the one that you're gonna be able to put on your label, 
is dependent on the results of at least 10 individual SPF results. Um, and then there are calculations done dependent on the standard deviation, uh, confidence intervals, things like that, um, which will then determine your label SPF. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of what one individual's SPF value may be. Um, but that's not to say that everyone will be around 13. At the end of the day, this fake sample that we're testing right now may come back and everybody else have a little bit of a higher SPF value, which may result in this product label being an SPF 15. It may happen. Um, on the flip side, it may just so happen as well that everybody else that we test has an SPF 13, maybe a 10. Um, and again, that would bring this SPF value, not necessarily to the targeted SPF 15. Um, and that's just, of course, dependent on how individuals are reacting to the UV exposures uh, and also dependent on, you know, what a company or a client is comfortable claiming on their product. If for some reason the sample is not meeting the target SPF 15 value that you're interested in claiming, we could stop testing at any time and we can discuss options of uh, retesting maybe a new sample uh, later on. So those were, that was a very nice uh, example of a very simple test. Um, however, there are circumstances where we would have to invalidate or reject results. And there's a number of reasons that we would have. Um, so the first reason is that the exposure series on a subject fails to elicit an erythema response on any subsite. So basically what that means is I am not seeing any redness on the test site whatsoever following UV exposures. Uh, controversy, conversely, um, we could have all subsites in the exposure series show an erythema response. So we're seeing redness on every single site of UV that we we gave over that product. Another one is that we can have erythema responses within an exposure series are randomly absent. So maybe we saw erythema at subsite three, but then there's nothing at four, and then something again at five. Um, and then I, I also have some, some photo examples to show you following this. Uh, we can reject a result because the test subject is not compliant. So remember, when a subject leaves, we tell them all the do nots. Do not do this, do not take that. Um, if for some reason they do not follow those instructions, they're considered non-compliant um, and their results are then invalidated. Lastly, uh, we could have a technical failure, and this is just a failure of equipment or procedures during the treatment phase. Maybe uh, an in incorrect exposure time was or dose was given, the site application of sunscreen wasn't sufficient. Um, so anything that would jeopardize the integrity of the test would result in a rejected or invalidated result. So to take this a little further, um, this example is one that all subsites in an exposure series show an erythema response. So basically what happened here is the sunscreen is applied, the UV doses were given, assuming that the sunscreen is protecting at a certain SPF level, and it did not protect not only at that level, but anywhere near that level. So this is what we would consider an invalidated or rejected result. In the case of something like this happening, my first thing is to come to our client or whoever is providing us with a sunscreen test and letting them know it's not meeting whatever target SPF value you were intending. So the options are A, to either stop the test entirely and reformulate, or B, would be to lower your target SPF value. Another rejected result is when an exposure series on a subject does not elicit any erythema response on any subsite whatsoever. So again, product was applied to the site, UV doses were given in accordance with the expected SPF value, and we got no erythema response. So what that's telling me is not only is the product protecting at whatever level you are targeting, it's protecting way better than that. So in a circumstance like this, what we're gonna do is we're actually going to go ahead and increase that target SPF value, increase the UV doses that we're giving over that product protected site, and hopefully determining an SPF value that's actually even better than what was expected. 
And then this is also the illogical sequence or exposures being randomly absent. Um, as we discussed earlier, each UV dose is progressively higher than the previous one. So when you're seeing uh, erythema responses, for example, on this on-site three, nothing at four, nothing at five, and then at six again, the assumption is, is that because the site four is progressively higher than three, five is higher than four, and six is higher than five, the assumption is that you should be seeing erythema responses on sites three, four, five, and six. Um, so because of that, you know, maybe this is an uneven application, maybe this is um, something going on with subject skin, we don't know, but because of that, this would be an invalidated and rejected result. So I'll kind of just run through this real quick. Um, so that was an overall general, very general, very basic uh, example of SPF testing. Um, we can also do water resistance testing. Of course, this is going to provide you with that water resistance claim on your sunscreen label. Uh, for water resistance testing, after product application and dry time, subjects are placed in a water immersion device, such as a pool, whirlpool, tub, bathtub, something with water jets, something that circulates the water. After they are in this immersion device for a set period of time, we then do the UV exposures. So it's the same process as the normal SPF test, but we slip in a little bit of a water immersion in between the dry time and the exposures. The FDA allows for either 40 or 80 minute water immersions. The test only requires an immersed or a wet determination. And then the label claim is determined from the UV exposures after that immersion. Uh, Kalipa allows for either 40 or 80 minute water immersion tests. It requires both static and water immersed determinations. And then the product is considered water resistant after you do a number of statistical calculations and the water immersed SPF value is at least 50% of the static or the dry SPF value. For example, if you want to claim an SPF 30 water resistant using the Kalipa method, your static or your dry SPF has to meet an SPF 30 claim, and then your water immersed test has to meet at least an SPF 15 claim. So in that situation, you would be able to claim an SPF 30 water resistant. Australia New Zealand has their own water resistance method. Um, it allows for a minimum of a 40 minute immersion and up to four hours, depending on the SPF value. Uh, this test like the FDA only requires a water immersed determination site and the label SPF claim is determined from that immersion. There's new water resistance standards now that were introduced in 2020. Um, prior to this, there were no standardized water resistance protocols from the international uh, organization. So now they have ISO 16217 and 18861. These are basically beefed up methods of the Kalipa in the Australia and New Zealand. Um, they now they specify certain criteria of the water, for example, the hardness, the pH level, um, the flow of the water. So everything is, is more specific in these standards, but essentially the ISO 16217 is very similar to the Australia New Zealand and the 18861 is very similar to the Kalipa. Um, and then both of these standards are read in conjunction with the ISO 24 test method, which is your, your typical SPF determination. Um, so basically they follow that same procedure as what we had previously discussed, but these standards now specify how to do the water resistance portion of it. We also do UVA protection factor testing. Um, it's an international testing procedure. It's very comparable to the SPF determination test, the ISO 24444, um, basically how we had discussed earlier, except this one utilizes the UVA portion of the solar simulator. So again, we're looking to see how the product protects against the UVA range and not necessarily the whole spectrum UVA plus UVB. Uh, the test method is widely used in many countries. However, it is not an accepted method in 
S. Uh, instead of ass assessing the erythemal or the sunburn redness responses, this test is assessing the persistent pigment darkening or PPD responses, which is essentially tanning of the skin. Um, it's not a requirement to be formed in most countries. Again, this goes back to making sure we check the regulations of where you want to market to make sure it is not a requirement. Um, a lot of the times we'll get the question, so what can I do with this claim? If you've ever seen a sunscreen that has a PA claim on it, on it, PA plus through four pluses, this is the test that's gonna give you that claim. So um, it has different levels of UVA protection, and then that will determine how many pluses you can put after your PA claim. The major differences between this test and the static determination test is, is just it's SPF versus UVA claims. The static determination test is, like I said, a, a full spectrum UVA plus UVB exposure, whereas the ISO 42 test is UVA only. The subject selection of skin type is a little different. If you um, are doing the normal static test, you're using those first three types of individuals with fair to light beige skin. The 42 or the UVA test just steps it up one more. So you're using somewhat fair to a little bit more tan in skin tone. Again, this test is looking to assess a tanning or a pigmented response as opposed to a redness response. So individuals with a little bit more melanin in their, in their system will probably respond better to a tanning response. And a different sunscreen standard is used as a control in this test as opposed to the uh, SPF determination test. We also do in vitro testing for broad spectrum claims. Uh, there's two methodologies. Again, FDA has their own, they're in their own world. And the ISO method, um, we'll just call it ISO 43 for short. Uh, unlike the SPF determination test, these two in vitro methods are very different from one another. Whereas um, if you're just doing an SPF label claim between the FDA and international, the testing methods are very similar. Um, both of these tests require use of a spectrophotometer and a solar simulator to test PMMA plates. Uh, just a quick rundown of the equipment that we're using here. We're using a, um, the solar light equipment. The solar simulator can irradiate up to four PMMA plates simultaneously, which is lovely. Um, and then on the right, we have our spectrophotometer. It can auto scan all the PMMA plates in specific or in multiple locations. Um, it stores the data in, in a various number of wavelengths. However, for our standards, we're using the one nanometer wavelength. So it's taking a measurement of the absorbance of the sample at every one nanometer throughout the UV spectrum of 290 to 400. For the FDA, sunscreen is, a pro, uh, sunscreen is applied to the PMMA, PMMA plates at a rate of 0 0.75 milligrams per centimeter squared. These plates are then allowed to dry for a specified amount of time and in specific conditions. And then we place them through the, uh, they're irradiated using the solar simulator and then they're placed through the light path of the spectrophotometer. So uh, again, we measure the transmittance values at one nanometer intervals on five different locations of each plate. And it's also compared to a control PMA plate. In order to claim broad spectrum in the US, the critical wavelength that results from this test has to be greater than or equal to 370 nanometers. The international test on the other hand is, oh, apologies to my typo. It's applied to the PMA plates at a little bit of a heavier rate. It's 1.3 milligrams per centimeter squared. Again, the plates are allowed to dry for a specified amount of time in, a specific, in specific conditions. And convert, uh, as opposed to the FDA test, these plates are first run through the spectrophotometer prior to UV irradiation. Then they are irradiated using the solar simulator according to a mathematical adjustment of the initial UV absorbance. And then they're placed in the spectrophotometer after UV irradiation. The FDA requires just apply the product to the plates, irradiate, run through the spectrophotometer. Whereas the international regulations require essentially a before irradiation and an after irradiation. 
Again, this method is controlled by the use of a reference sunscreen. Um, the same procedure is followed using this reference sunscreen as is the, the, the test product. Again, the reference has to fall within accepted limits for the test to be considered valid. And then this methodology also requires a more thorough and regular calibration of the spectrophotometer and a plate this test. So in order to claim broad spectrum using this method, not only must the critical wavelength be greater than or equal to 7 nanometers, but it, the UVA protection factor, the in vitro UVA protection factor, must also be greater than or equal to one third of the SPF wavelength. So it has to meet both of these requirements in order to have that broad spectrum claim, whereas the FDA just has to meet the critical wavelength requirement. This is a little visual of how samples are applied to the PMA plate, very similar to that of SPF testing using those little dots. And then again, you're using circular motions to spread the product over the plate and then horizontal vertical motions to even out that nice layer. We also offer some sunscreen safety tests here, um, phototoxicity and photoallergy. Phototoxicity evaluates the potential of a phototoxic or a short-term response to sunscreen products. Um, so in a phototoxicity test, the, the product is applied to an individual and they're irradiated only once to see if we're going to get a short-term response to that UV. Photoallergy, on the other hand, evaluates for allergenic responses to a sunscreen product following multiple UV exposures over an extended period of time. So the product is reapplied to an individual a number of times. After each reapplication, the product is being exposed to UV. So not only are we evaluating if there is any irritation responses, immediate responses following UV exposure, um, we are then going to evaluate if this product will provide like an allergy. So once we do this consecutive applications and exposures, we'll then tell the individual to go on a break. So about 10 days, they're gonna have no product application, no, no UV exposure. After those 10 days, they're gonna come back and we're gonna do what's called a challenge. We're then going to reapply the product, re-expose it to UV, and then see if there's any responses. That response after the challenge phase is gonna let us know if, if we're causing any photo allergy responses. So there's major differences in SPF, uh, some major differences in SPF testing between the FDA method and the internationally accepted method. Um, but most of these noticeable differences, again, are not from the testing methodologies at all, but really in the classification, formulation, and labeling of sunscreen products. FDA classifies sunscreen as drugs, whereas countries that accept ISO may classify them as cosmetics. Uh, further classifications exist. Um, so you'd have to be specific in what type of classification you're attempting to make. Uh, FDA and ISO differ in their approved active ingredients for UVB and UVA filters. Um, it's actually a very important one that's happening right now in the sunscreen testing world. Uh, active ingredients are under a lot of scrutiny, specifically in the US, mind you. Uh, currently, the FDA has no strict guideline on a highest SPF value you can claim, whereas the international limits the SPF claim to 50 plus. Um, they also require SPF claims to correspond to a lowest number in a range, whereas the FDA allows for any number to be claimed. Um, this one in particular is undergoing some evaluation with the FDA specifically. Um, if you're aware of what's really going on in the sunscreen testing world, there has been um, a proposed rule to, to finalize the sunscreen testing monograph in the FDA, and they're looking to make a number of changes, and this is actually one of them, is to limit the SPF claim. Uh, the label warnings that are required differ between the testing guidelines. Um, currently, the international regulation recognizes powders and sprays as accepted dosage forms of sunscreen, whereas the FDA has yet to include this in the final monograph. This is another point of conversation in the current rule is to actually include um, powders specifically into the final monograph. Uh, so it's definitely still a conversation that's happening. There's also a number of other conversations that's happening in this final rule, but as of today, there is no final monograph. So 
challenges in SPF testing. So this is also a very large part of testing is that sometimes the product is not testing as well as one may hope. So why is that? First and foremost, the biggest challenge is the ability to spread the sunscreen product. It's super important that sunscreen products have good spreadability. Um, this is a huge impact on the testing. If the product is not able to be spread sufficiently, it's going to impact the UV results. So what we're gonna do on our end, when you submit us a sample is we're gonna take that product before we even test it on an individual, we are going to practice the spreading of it. We are going to attempt a number of different methods. Uh, maybe it needs more circles to cover the area, less circles, the horizontals, the verticals. We're gonna try a number of different things to make sure that we can obtain uniform coverage. Of the if we cannot, um, or if we note obstacles that may impact the testing, we're gonna let you know. Um, so some of the things that may impact the spreadability is, is how quickly does the product dry? Does it clump or stick together during the spreading? Does it separate too quickly? Maybe a biphase and it's separating too quickly, whereas the uniformity of or the dispersion of the actives is being affected. Um, there's a quick example photo on the right hand side of a product that was attempted to be spread, I want to say 20 times different methods. Um, but it was sticky, it was clumping together, and under UV, that is what the uniformity of it would look like in the testing. Um, when something like this happens, like I mentioned, we're gonna give you a call and say, hey, here's the difficulty we're having, um, what would you like us to do? So spreadability is super important for SPF testing. Um, and then lastly, another big challenge is, is the formulation itself. Sunscreens are not easy to formulate. There's a lot of things that are happening um, in formulations, especially right now, where you know it's, it's providing difficulty. So we always suggest that you review your formulation and verify that the product is what you're expecting prior to testing it on people. Um, We've run into all these issues, so it's not that they're unheard of. So it's very important that when you verify that the percent of the active in the, in the sample actually correlate to what you're expecting of the SPF value. So um, there's a lot of research on, on what SPF value you can get given X percent of active ingredients. Um, the general rule of thumb, very general, is you can probably expect about two SPF values for every percent of active in your sample. Um, that's very dependent though on what actives you're using. Some actives, you may only get one SPF value for, for every percent. Some you may get two and a half, but the rule of thumb is you're getting around two. So if you're submitting a sample and there's 5% of active ingredients, it's very unlikely that you're gonna reach an SPF value, right? So for every percent, you can expect two SPF values. For 5%, you can expect 10. But again, that's also dependent on what else is in your formula. Are you using boosters, things like that. Uh, it's super important that you check your final formulation. Do you need an assay to confirm that these actives are actually present in the expected amount? Do you want to do stability testing, pH verification? It's all very important things that may impact the SPF results. Um, so those are always some things that you may want to consider doing prior to actually testing your sunscreen. Um, shameless plug, if you do ever need any of these things, uh, we do offer them as well at BioScreen. So you can always reach out for testing needs. Um, are there other ingredients in the formulation that may hinder the effectiveness of the actives? Uh, that is very common. Um, there also may be ingredients in the formulation that may benefit the effectiveness of the active, so those boosters. Um, so it's super important to understand the rest of the ingredients in the formulation and not specifically focusing on the percent or the number of active very important to verify that there's proper dispersion for uniformity of the ingredients throughout the sample. Um, this can be accomplished through optical microscopy, uh, where you would spread the sample and take a look at it, um, and you would be able to determine if maybe the actives are spreading very nicely, very uniformly dispersed, or if maybe they're clumping together, that's something that you may be able to see.
And then lastly, it's very important. You check your sourcing, check your ingredient sourcing, talk to your suppliers, your manufacturers, ask questions. Where, you know, where are they getting their stuff? Are they getting it tested? Where are they getting it tested? Is it being tested appropriately? Um, there's, it never hurts to ask questions. Um, you know, 99% of the time, the sourcing is just wonderful and perfect, but it's always important to make sure that you're taking these steps so that your sunscreen product will perform to its best. Okay, um, but that's pretty much my breakdown today of sunscreen testing. Uh, like I said, it's a very, very simple, simple breakdown of what we do. Um, if you ever have any more technical questions or any further questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, I will direct you to our Director of Sales and Marketing, Adam, who can also help you with any questions, not only with SPF testing, but we also do a number of uh, various testing on products at Bioscreen. So, if you're not ready to test your sunscreen, we also have a whole range of other things, including those tests that I mentioned earlier. Um, but outside of that, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my spiel today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jordan, for sharing your expertise on this topic today. This was a very interesting presentation, so we thank you. Before we begin the Q&A, I would like to ask everyone to take our survey. You can find the link in the chat section. We will give you two minutes. We will open the forum for questions now. Please write out your question using the Q&A function in the toolbar at the bottom of this screen. I will give everyone a few moments to type in your questions. In the meantime, I'll review some brief notes. This webinar presentation has been recorded. All participants of this webinar will receive a follow-up email once the recording is available to view. We also post our webinars on our ALS global website and our ALS YouTube channel in the webinar playlist. Also, please follow our company page on LinkedIn as we post announcements and registration links to future webinars and other resources and updates. Our first question coming in from Amy Ann is, if a brand was creating sunscreen for FIS 4.6 how would they do testing to prove that it works in four, six? Good question. Um, according to the regulations, you can't. Uh, so FITS one through three is where we're landing, but 
the assumption is, is that should a product protect on fits one through three, who are the individuals that are most susceptible to burning from UV, if the product is protecting on these individuals, the assumption is that it's also going to protect on fits fours through six. You wanna keep in mind fits four through six, um, these individuals have more melanin, which is a natural UV protectant. So by testing on individuals who are much more lacking in that natural UV protection, um, will essentially prove that it's going to work on the entire range of Fitzpatrick's. Thank you. Our next question, how long does the static SPF testing take? Can it be done in three person, then adding seven, and what is the timing? Yeah, um, the static SPF testing can, our current, let's just say, our current turnaround time right now is approximately four weeks for a 10 subject panel. So if you wanna test your sample, you're looking at about four weeks for full 10 subject results. Can we test less to start? Absolutely. Um, we actually have a policy here at Bioscreen that we're always gonna start with three and we're gonna let you know how your product is performing. So, uh, we're gonna give you these preliminary results regardless of whether you're only asking for three, five or 10 subjects, just to kind of keep you in the loop. But yeah, you're more than welcome to submit a test request for only three subjects. That's obviously gonna be taking less time than the entire four weeks for a 10 panel. Um, and then it can be scaled up to add the the additional seven to complete everything. Great. We have a question from Susan. Is it recommended to perform stability testing on actives on all and all mineral sunscreen? I would recommend performing stability testing period. Um, it's, it's, and bear with me because stability is, is a little bit outside of my, my testing expertise. It's, it's a different department here. Um, I'm unsure if it's actually required, uh, but it's, actually, it's an important part of, of testing your product. Okay, one more question. Is phototoxicity and photoallergy require FDA testing? No, uh, the FDA nor any regulations really require it. Um, it's just an additional safety measure that some companies some might take uh, to prove the safety of their, their product. Do we have any more questions? Well, thank you for attending our webinar Wednesday. You can contact Jordan for any questions and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, have a good day.